Welcome to another edition of the Hank Unplugged podcast, and today is very, very significant. I want to begin by saying something about Columbus, and you'll see why in just a moment. Back in 1912, President William Howard Taft presided over the unveiling of the Columbus Memorial at Washington's Union Station. If we fast forward some 70 years, 1981, President Ronald Reagan lauded Columbus as a brilliant navigator, as a fearless man of action, as a visionary who opened the eyes of an older world to an entirely new world, as a man who personified a view of the world to an entirely new one, and above all, as a man who personifies a view of the world that many see as quintessentially American, not merely optimistic, but scornful of the very notion of despair. Think about today. Today, millions of of Americans, particularly young Americans, view Columbus from an entirely different vantage point. His statues, his images, his very recollection sparks anger and outrage and carnage. Just this past Columbus Day, you might recall that Demonstrators toppled statues of Abraham Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt in Portland. The headlines in USA Today summed up the carnage. I'll never forget these headlines that said Portland protesters knocked down Roosevelt Lincoln's statues in rage toward, toward what? Toward Columbus Day. Protest organizers dubbed the event Indigenous People's Day of Rage. They threw chains around Roosevelt's statue. They threw red paint on the monument. They used a blowtorch on the statue's base. And then after toppling the statues, the hordes began smashing windows at the Oregon Historical Society. So here's the question. What could possibly motivate American citizens, supposed exemplars of social justice, to behave with such wanton recklessness in a supposed era of wokeness and progressive values? That question was foremost in my mind as I prepared to do a Bible Answer Man broadcast in commemoration of Columbus Day 2020. Why? Because I wanted my audience to join me in celebrating the founding of our great nation. So early that morning, I engaged in a Google exploration in order to provide my audience with color commentary on a brilliant navigator, on a visionary, on a Christian icon intent on spreading the message of Christ to those he encountered in a new world. But in page after page after page of Google exploration, an entirely different Columbus emerged. After Well, it was a couple of hours at least of reading. I began to wonder whether my perception of Columbus was entirely unrealistic. The picture that emerged from my Google exploration was that of a nefarious character, of a a ruthless, money-grubbing, genocidal maniac who severed hands, who raped women, who enslaved gentle people to satisfy a white supremacist lust for gold and glory. It wasn't long until my Google exploration revealed an excerpt 
from a book titled Debunking Howard Zinn, Exposing the Fake History That Turned a Generation Against America. If Mary Graybar, the author of this book, was to be believed, much of what I had read online, and that for hours and hours, had its genesis in the pontifications of a man named Howard Zinn. Think about the power of one, one man, affecting so many people. Well, anyway, I ordered the book and I began to read. And what I discovered explains much of what we are experiencing right now in America. Anti-American revisionist history that, in Dr. Mary Graper's words, has succeeded in persuading large swaths of American people to despise their country, to despise Western civilization, to despise America. Well, Mary Graber is a resident fellow at the Alexander Hamilton Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. She earned her PhD in English from the University of Georgia, and she has taught at the college level for 20 years or more, most recently at Emory University, and she was born in Slovenia, and Slovenia was still part of the communist Yugoslavia. She's the author of many publications, including one of the most important books I've read this year, a book titled Debunking Howard Zinn, Exposing the Fake History That Turned a Generation Against America. And she is my guest today. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. That was an amazing story. Well, it's exactly what happened to me. I mean, I actually, as I was doing my research, I started doubting my own interpretation of history. I started wondering, have I swallowed the Kool-Aid? Have I <laughs> developed some false idea about Christopher Columbus? I mean, it was so compelling. And the narrative was always very, very much the same. And I kept going through one entry after another. And I spent a couple of hours on this. And then, then finally, I came across your article. Well, I, I want to ask you, uh, how many pages down was it, like 1,000-something? <laughs> well, I don't know exactly how many pages, but it was a lot of pages. I remember thinking, I've gone through 10 or 20 pages in my Google exploration. So, yeah, I mean, the narrative is ubiquitous on the web. And I guess that leads me to the first question I want to talk to you about today, and that is, how has Howard Zinn succeeded in the Zinnification of history? Well, Howard Zinn, who died in 2010, was quite a phenomenon. He was a celebrity radical and, incidentally, a historian. And so he rode the wave of celebrity dumb. He purported to be leading students on civil rights protests while he was teaching at Spelman College. And then after he was kicked out there, he went to Boston University and led them on anti-Vietnam War protests, which were really protests in support of Ho Chi Minh, uh, who, you know, Howard Zinn saw as, you know, the exemplar of democracy. So, you know, when he wrote his book, People's History of the United States, and it came out in 1980, you know, think about that, over 40 years ago, he had been in the news quite a bit. He had went on a mission to North Vietnam to bring back American prisoners of war. He was at the forefront of protests. He was debating Bill Buckley. He was in the news, and so he got a head start. And as I expose in my book, and it was much to my shock as I read it, he plagiarized from a book for high school students by one of his radical anti-Vietnam War pals, another socialist, and took the credit for it. And, you know, anytime you pick up a news article or look at a news article about Columbus Day, you have reporters basically quoting the Zen version as if it were established history. And, you know, there's no question about it. So he was quite a marketing guru for the radical communist view. And as I also discovered, is that, you know, his story of Christopher Columbus, along with everything else he says 
about American history is basically the version that has been put out by Marxists and communists from Karl Marx on down to William Z. Foster. But it's become accepted truth, and it's what Google, which is a monopoly, promotes. And, you know, we're seeing the clampdown of the tech industries right now, and, you know, they've been at it for a while, and it's a very, very dangerous thing. And if you're sitting there, you know, someone who's an adult and knowledgeable in history, and you're starting to doubt yourself, just think about a 15-year-old who's writing a report for a class and is Googling this or has been assigned Howard Zinn's book. And that's why you've got these young, enraged people who are out on the streets and, you know, doing what you described they did in Portland. You know, I want you to address this from the standpoint of what you're alluding to right now, from the standpoint of the entertainment industry, the educational industry, the environmental industry, other industries as well. I've often said that the problem ultimately is not fixed at the ballot box. The ballot box is necessary, but it's insufficient despotism, revisionist history are not magically redeemed by political victories. Even during the Reagan revolution, illiberal liberalism held sway in all kinds of our cultural institutions. And they're disseminating information and ideological constructs that are driving Western civilization in a very dangerous direction. And the reason I bring this up, Mary, is in the beginning of your book, you bring up Matt Damon and Goodwill Hunting. Yeah. And I've heard this personally from people who said that they first heard about Howard Zinn from that 1997 movie that Matt Damon and Ben Affleck wrote and starred in called Goodwill Hunting. And Howard Zinn's book is featured prominently in that movie. So Will Hunting, played by Matt Damon, is a troubled 20-year-old, lower-class, white, working-class guy who works as a janitor at MIT, but of course, because of, you know, the <laughs> class structure of American society, according to the script, you know, he is unrecognized until finally, you know, he meets a professor there and then he's sent to therapy so he can get over the trauma of his childhood. Uh, he was abused as a child. And as he is in the office, he's looking around and notices these books on a shelf, and one is a multi-volume history of the United States, and then he tells the psychiatrist, played by Robin Williams, you know, kind of sneers at that title and says, if you want to read a real history book, you know, read Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, that book will knock you off your you-know-what. And so there was a prominent role there for Howard Zinn, and that launched him into, you know, even more stardom in 1997. Now, the personal history between Matt Damon and Howard Zinn is that Matt Damon grew up next door to the Zins, and Howard Zinn's book came out in 1980 when Matt Damon was 10 years old, and his mother, who was a professor, I believe at Lehigh University, was also a progressive leftist, and, you know, she's the one who probably got him a copy of Howard Zinn's book, and he was taken in as a 10-year-old and on Columbus Day presented this report to his class about, you know, who Columbus really was. And so you've got Matt Damon, who as a young child is already, you know, brainwashed, and I guess apparently on a personal level, you know, he liked the Zins. Howard Zinn brags that they fed him cookies. But as a result of that friendship, Howard Zinn's book gets a prominent place in an award-winning movie. And so it's a kind of a personal connection there. And, of course, you know, what you have in that movie is this message that a genius because this guy really is a genius, the Matt Damon character, a genius recommends 
Howard Zinn's book. And so, you know, the message to the audience watching this is, well, this is, you know, the book to beat all history books. And if you read it, that's all you need to know. The others are false. And, of course, Howard Zinn, within the pages of a people's history, promotes that message. He knocks down other historians and he says, you know, these guys were all wrong. They had these white supremacist motivations and I'm going to tell you the truth. But of course, it's not the truth. It's all a bunch of lies. Yeah. And I think what's so important about your book, I mean, when you think about debunking Howard Zinn, you're thinking about a man, but the significance of your work is that you are talking about a person who succeeded in convincing an entire generation of Americans that the nation Abraham Lincoln called the last best hope of earth is essentially a racist criminal enterprise that's built on murdering Indians, on exploiting slaves, on oppressing the working man and woman, and that it has to be replaced by something better, by a classless, egalitarian society. And when we're talking about Zinn, we're really talking about someone who is exploiting Marxist ideology. Yes. Well, Howard Zinn actually was a member of the Communist Party. Um, You know, just think about, you know, all the communists, who were passing around secrets and risking their lives and currying messages and, you know, passing on money from the Soviet Union and meeting at dark street corners and, you know, doing espionage. You know, think about all the harm they did. Well, Howard Zinn, according to the analysis by Ron Radish, the historian and former member of the Communist Party, his analysis of the FBI files of Howard Zinn, he comes to the conclusion that Howard Zinn was indeed a member of the Communist Party USA, and he was a member from around 1948 to 1953. So, you know, he was very successful in terms of doing what the Soviet Union wanted a good communist to do, and that was to turn Americans against their own country and to believe that a communistic form of government is more just and is a better form of government. And the upshot of reading Howard Zinn's book is that there is a message there, that there is a way to finally make this country right, make it a real democracy. And the way to do that is to overthrow the government and institute a communistic, socialistic, anarchistic government in its place. And so as a propagandist of the communist message, Howard Zinn was very, very successful Now, you know, the average reader, you know, the teenager who has been assigned this book in class may not necessarily make the direct connection to, oh, yeah, the Communist Manifesto, you know, this is what this book is promoting. But he does have the sense that there is something fundamentally wrong with this country. It's unjust. It has made so many people suffer and that it needs to be overturned. And so you have this sort of mass hysteria that we saw this summer with these hordes of young people who've been educated with this poisonous view of history just, you know, irrationally attacking everything. You know, any any marker of American history, you know, even, you know, the great emancipator, (laughs) Abraham Lincoln, it's really astounding, but that is the fruit of Howard Zinn's book, which has also been spread in many other ways in addition to being used as a textbook. And so we saw the outcome this summer, and we're seeing it still. I mean, 
you know, these protests haven't ended in Portland. I mean, it's still going on. It's really unbelievable in a way. Yeah, You know, what's really profound, I think, about your book is that you expose the rhetorical tricks that are used by Howard Zinn, the use of ellipses to have Christopher Columbus in his own logs say something entirely different than what he actually said. <laughs> so he is very, very clever, because if you just read what Zinn is communicating and what has been regurgitated over and over again, you read it for yourself and you think this is a genocidal maniac. But you have to yeah. take into account that he is using rhetorical tricks. He is using all kinds of methods to make Columbus the discoverer of the new world into something that he really isn't at all. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if I had done that, with a book I had written or a paper, or if a freshman, when I was teaching college, had done that, the freshman would have failed. My reputation as a writer would have been ruined. The book probably would have been pulped. The publisher would have nothing to do with me if they had discovered that I had written deceptively, willfully, deceptively. And Howard Zinn does that not only with Columbus, but with everything in his book. He twists around things that people say to make them mean the exact opposite. If you or I or anyone else had done that, our reputations would be ruined. But with Howard Zinn, no one really discovered that. No one, you know, looked at his writing that closely. So he got away with it. And you would think that at this point, my book has been out for a year and a half now, you would think that someone would say, well, you know, regardless of the ideological position, this book is false because it misrepresents the people he's quoting, and therefore it should be removed, but nothing like that has been done. As a matter of fact, I have been attacked by professors. I was on the panel at the White House Constitution Day talking about Zinn, and I was called a Nazi on Twitter by someone who teaches at SUNY Geneseo here in western New York. I've had a bunch of these history professors come out and attack me simply for stating that, you know, this is a book that is full of lies and distortions. And for that reason alone, it should not ever be used in the classroom. Talk about the difference, and you're alluding to this, between an old school liberal, a believer in the self-correcting character of American democracy, and a radical left-wing liberal who is believing that something is fundamentally wrong with this country, so wrong that you have to stand up for someone like Howard Zinn? Yeah, well, the historian that comes to mind is Arthur Schlesinger Jr., right? The biographer of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I mean, towards the end of his life, he was becoming disturbed by multiculturalism and how it was fragmenting Americans and setting them against each other in ethnic and racial groups. I mean, there are very many good old-school liberal historians, and I quote them in my book, and one can read them and know that they did not do what Howard Zinn did, which is to misrepresent and distort and lie and leave out contradictory information. I mean, we may not agree with the conclusions they come to, but they don't deliberately lie. There are some historians and scholars who don't do what Howard Zinn did, but we've increasingly come to the point where truth doesn't matter. You know, I would have, in my naivete, thought that someone on the left who would agree with Howard Zinn's political views would say, well, 
you know, hey, we can't stand for this because here, look what he's doing. He's, you know, misrepresenting sources. He's lying. But they don't have those standards that used to inform the profession. You know, there was this sort of agreement. You could go to a conference, you could disagree about, you know, your interpretations on a matter of literature or history, but you debated on the basis of the evidence. And if you had lied about the evidence, you would have been kicked out. (laughs) But yet here the profession has become politicized So you have people teaching who are ideologues first, and they often follow Howard Zinn in twisting around the evidence to suit what they want to push as a left-wing point. And it's the decay of education and scholarship that I've been seeing the last few decades. And it really, it really is appalling. I mean, this notion that truth doesn't matter. When you get to that point, there's no way to communicate with someone else. And I think we're seeing that now in our political discourse. There isn't a basis of reality of evidence that people can base their conversations on. It's power struggles, it's ideology. And I'm seeing this, you know, emanate from what I saw on the college campus almost 30 years ago now. Talk about Spelman College. This is a classic case study because here you have a distinctly Christian school with a Christian education that has become radicalized and so radicalized that in 2005, as you point out in your book, you have Howard Zinn as the commencement speaker. Right. Well, yeah, that's a very interesting story. You know, and I talked about Howard Zinn's years in the Communist Party. He did what communists were ordered to do in the late 1950s, and that was to leave the Communist Party officially and to infiltrate the institutions. And Howard Zinn went down to Spelman College. And at the time, the president was Albert Manley. He was the first male president and the first black president. And Spelman College is a small Christian school for black women. It was originally set up to teach ex-slaves how to read. And Howard Zinn saw his opportunity there. He radicalized the students. He claimed to be leading them on civil rights protests, but what he did was, you know, in the classroom, he brought in communist speakers, he taught them his communist version of history, he told them to defy the administration. So, you know, it being a Christian school, chapel attendance every day was mandatory, there was a dress code, there was a curfew, And a lot of this, especially the curfew, was for the students' own well-being. I mean, the reality was that in the late 50s, early 60s, you really did not want to be a young black woman out and about. So Howard Zinn riled up the students, encouraged them to defy all these rules, the dress code, the curfew, the chapel attendance, and... Therefore, he was fired by Albert Manley for insubordination. And so in 1963, Howard Zinn checked his mailbox one last time before he and his wife and kids were about to go off in the car on their trip up north for the summer and found a check for a year's pay and his termination notice. The check was, you know, for the year he would not be teaching. So he was kicked out of that school for good reason. And then the sordid story goes on with, you know, the morals charge and all that. And Howard Zinn also in the Nation magazine 
wrote this article that mocked the school, that called it a finishing school for young black ladies, you know, that it wasn't very serious, it wasn't very scholarly, and he was radicalizing it. He admitted it. And so what you had was the administration with crowds of students, you know, demanding meetings, defying rules, not adhering to the educational standards. So Zinn was a troublemaker, and he deliberately set out to do that when he came to Spelman College. Is all of this about revolution? I mean, when you use that word, it seems to be a little dramatic. But Marx, as you point out, said that revolutions are the locomotives of history. And Zinn said in his autobiography that you can't be neutral on a moving train. So it seems to me that there's a bigger issue at play here in terms of America. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's to change the character of Americans. And you've got the cultural Marxists who came here, Gramsci and all those guys, and they didn't need to fire a single bullet. They didn't need to take risks. I mean, as a matter of fact, Zinn and all these guys led very charmed lives, you know, doing the kind of work, you know, that wasn't really much work, not even in terms of writing lesson plans and doing research and grading papers, which can be, you know, work, but just sort of using the classroom as a platform. They were invited to give lectures, you know, around the globe. Howard Zinn went to France and trotted all over Europe and South Africa and was wined and dined. And if you've got people who are, in the case of Howard Zinn's students at Spelman, very angry and believing that the form of government we have is corrupt and something that can't be reformed, while they're going to implement those ideas at the voting booth, they're going to implement them on the job, they're going to be going out and teaching from generation to generation, you're going to be getting this version of American history and of what America is. And, you know, every time I see Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, hear what she says, I immediately think of Howard Zinn. I mean, this is what our educational system and the kind of history that is being taught has produced. Yeah, I was going to say tongue-in-cheek, lighten up, Dr. Graber. I mean, after all, Zinn is dead. His influence is waning. But as you've pointed out in your book, his influence is not waning at all. And I want you to talk a little bit about the Zen Educational Project, because this is taking Zen and multiplying them all over the world. Oh, yeah. So the Zen Education Project was started by one of his adoring students at Boston University. And this man, ironically, went out and made a lot of money in the tech industry and decided to, as he said it, give back and donated money to start the Zen Education Project. And it's a place where teachers can go get free downloadable lessons. They're all very political. They're based on Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States and other books that he's written. They have exercises for discussing current events, you know, such as the election. They have demonized President Trump and everyone who supports him. They are overtly political, overtly revolutionary, and so they are spreading the poison of Howard Zinn's history. They're doing it for free. And one of the latest things that's going on is in Mississippi, the governor has 
I don't know if they've already allocated this, but he's implementing or wants to implement history education that would be truthful, that would discuss the founders and American history in the non-Marxist way, you know, and patriotically. And so one of the campaigns that the Zen Education Project is on, and they do this every time anyone wants to reform education, is they appeal to teachers. They send out free copies of Howard Zinn's book. They have these letter-writing campaigns. And so they not only produce these classroom materials, but they produce these campaigns. And when I spoke at the White House conference, they went and attacked me. They didn't address at all what I said about Howard Zinn's book in my book, They simply called me someone who was out there attacking Howard Zinn as if, you know, I was just attacking him personally. So it's an organization that's supposed to be a nonprofit educational organization, but they are definitely political and are doing much to sell Zinn's book and to keep the ideas that Zinn promoted out there and available to teachers who are very happy to use these lessons and, you know, to get their students all agitated and riled up and ready to go out on protests. And, you know, when they're old enough, then they go out and knock down statues and burn buildings and attack police. The evidence that you produce in your book for things like elementary school children trying Columbus for murder. Just astounding. Or the fact that over 50% of millennials now say they would prefer to live in a socialist or communist country. It's absolutely astounding. And I bring this up because it shows just how significant the writing of your book is. Because if this was just your diatribe against Howard Zinn, personal animus, maybe someone would say, or envy from one scholar to another. That would be one thing. But I mean, this is about a macro issue in which you are presenting the ripened fruit of someone who has had an enormous impact on our culture. Yeah, and I think that's why I wrote the book. I mean, there is much to dislike about Howard Zinn as a person. He was not a nice person. But, you know, there are people out there like that. But what's really the issue is how his book continues to harm this country. You know, when you've got politicians who are citing a people's history for their proposals to replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. When you've got people taking oaths of office on a copy of a people's history instead of the Bible, as a few people have done, then you're talking about much more than one person. You're talking about a cultural phenomenon, a phenomenon that has revolutionized Americans, has changed their ways of thinking. There are other leftist books and histories. A lot of them do quote Howard Zinn, but I think Howard Zinn's book is sort of the one that stands out that's had probably the most influence for the longest period of time. I mean, William Z. Foster, who was the Communist Party chairman while Zinn was speaking at the Communist Party headquarters and teaching classes there in the 1950s, he wrote a book, Outline Political History of the Americas. That book never took off. It's got a similar take on American history, the Marxist take, you know, about Columbus and how, you know, this land was pristine and full of 
Native peoples who got along well and lived in harmony, which is, you know, a complete lie. It's been published. It's out there. You can probably still find it in a used bookstore, even though it was published in 1951. But it had very little impact. Howard Zinn's book has sold over 3 million copies. And it's not only those copies, but there are documentaries based on it. It's quoted in other books. There are graphic versions. There's a young people's version. There are the lessons. There are the spin-off books, like A People's History of the Civil War, you know, of the labor movement. And so it's permeated history, teaching, and education in so many ways. It's really hard to measure quantitatively, but it's out there. And like you said, you know, the Howard Zinn version of Columbus is now accepted as the true version. You mentioned the title of his book, and I want to ask you to spend a moment on that. It's called A People's History of the United States. And so you have this idea of someone who is innovative. He's writing history from the bottom up rather than from the top down. And that seems to be one of the things that people are now widely saying is so fantastic. You finally have a historian who isn't starting at the top, he's starting at the bottom. It's a people's history. Right. Well, I have no problem with writing a people's history if it were about, you know, real people. I come from an immigrant blue-collar background, and I think that there are great people who have made this country great, and their stories should be told. And I would like to have an opportunity to write some of those stories, people who have been overlooked. But that is not what Howard Zinn is doing. I mean, the term people's history, it's like the people's republic, you know, is it really the people? Similarly, the people in a people's history are people like Emma Goldman, Eugene Debs, you know, they are not regular people. You know, the guy who in the 1940s or 1950s carried a metal lunch pail to his job on the construction site or the farmer or the person who, you know, led a Boy Scout troop, you know, after he worked all day. You know, it's not about the people, the people of middle America or the people who were striving and who were poor but were good members of the community. These people are well-known radical communist and socialist leaders. There are other people, but they are people like a poor black woman that Zinn quotes, and she spouts off something, or he quotes her as saying something that is Marxist or that talks about class and race, but we know nothing else about her. So it's very disrespectful to those kinds of people, if indeed she is a person. So those people come in, they're anonymous, you don't remember them, but they're there just as mouthpieces for his Marxist ideas. And then the other people are the well-known communist agitators and leaders. So it's really quite absurd that people would think of this as a bottom-up history, as a history of average, ordinary working-class Americans. It's not that at all. Dr. Graber, I want you to put on your hat as a historian for just a moment, because I think we need to talk about history. You have the Zen version of how the New World was discovered, and what seems to be an underlying theme is that of greed. So tell us why there were so many Atlantic voyages from places like Spain. Well, Christopher Columbus's idea was to find a path to the Grand Khan and to retake Jerusalem and in the process to convert the natives and to spread the word of Jesus Christ. I mean, he 
was named after the patron saint of travelers. He felt that it was his mission to spread the word, and that's what he set out to do. And the goal that was to be acquired was to fund the trips in order to spread the word and to retake Jerusalem. So gold and riches were a means to fulfill the mission. And, you know, Europeans, like all peoples, were explorers. I mean, you look at the Native Americans. They were exploring. They were seeking new territory. There was conflict. So the notion that Christopher Columbus, as Zinn presents him, is somehow this uniquely greedy man who will chop off hands in order to get his gold because he's motivated by capitalistic greed is false. I mean, there were some abuses, but it wasn't due to Christopher Columbus's intent. As a matter of fact, he actually had some of his men hanged for cheating Indians. So you have all kinds of people through history. But I think the reason that Howard Zinn puts the blame on Christopher Columbus is it's easier to demonize one person and to sort of make him the boogeyman. And also, while he's doing that, he wanted to and succeeded in toppling the long revered figure of someone who discovered the New World and provided the opportunity for this country. That was the beginning. And so Howard Zinn wants to knock off that story right at the origins, and that's his way to do it. It's to attack Christopher Columbus. Now, of course, you know, as I said, it was his friend Hans Koning who wrote this screed, this little paperback screed for high school students against Columbus, but Howard Zinn is the one who popularized that version. He plagiarized from those pages and then made that the beginning of his history of the United States in total. In my own web explorations, I ran across the phrase, they would make fine servants, talking about the Indians. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. I read that over and over again. Before I ever knew about Howard Zinn, before I ever saw your book, before I ever saw your article on the web, And so you see this over and over again, and you think, wow, is this really what Christopher Columbus wrote in his log? That's pretty damning. Yeah. Well, you know, that's where you've got the ellipses. Uh, (laughs) And ellipses, you know, is if you can remember from your writing courses, is, you know, those three or four dots. And we know that they're there if you just simply want to shorten a quotation. And the words that you leave out do not change the fundamental meanings. And at the most, you know, if you have those four ellipses, it's, you know, a sentence or two. Well, what Howard Zinn leaves out is pages, two days worth of log entries between those ellipses. And so he's leaving out critical information and passages that say, I believe that we can convert them to our Christian faith more by love than by force. You know, Howard Zinn doesn't want the reader to know that Christopher Columbus wanted to convert by love. That would upset the propagandistic line that he is promoting. So he deceptively quotes that way. And people will still, I mean, it's very sad, they will quote, Howard Zinn quoting Columbus, and they will say, see, this is right from his log. You know, I got into a debate with a columnist at the New Haven newspaper, and even when I told him that what he was quote, you know, he had just discovered Howard Zinn and wrote this column for Columbus Day, I said, look, you know, this is what he left out. 
he didn't believe me. He said, no, this is what Christopher Columbus wrote. And it's so deceptive. But Howard Zinn would say, and you need to provide a counter to this, he would argue if he was alive, he'd say there's no such thing as objective history anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, that's to provide cover <laughs> yeah. uh, for his lying. And, you know, a lot of people repeat that, like this columnist did. He said, well, that's your take on history, and this was Howard Zinn's take. And, you know, we each have our own opinions, but that way of thinking has come to dominate. There is no truth. Everyone just has their own opinion or perspective and... You know, so that's that. But we're in deep trouble if we don't have any standards of truth. And this isn't a matter of debate, really, I mean, because you actually did the hard work. I mean, you've gone back and looked at the logs without the ellipses. Right. So this isn't a matter of your word against his. Truth bears out what you are saying. And the fact that what Christopher Columbus actually wrote in his logs and his diaries very, very different from what you read in your Google searches. Right, exactly. And unfortunately, there are other places in Zinn's book where he misrepresents authors. And what you find when you do a Google search is the Zinn version. So the author's original version has disappeared from the Internet. And, you know, people don't go back. They're not skeptical. They don't check the sources. I mean, you know, when I'm reading and doing research, I'm always flipping back to the footnotes. And if something doesn't sound right, I want to look it up. And that's what I set out to do with this book. I mean, when I first picked up Howard Zinn's book, now about 12 years ago, I thought, wow, this just can't be true. This just sounds so distorted. And when you do look at his sources and what he is saying and check with other historians, then you really see what he has done. And I guess some of that comes from having taught college English and, you know, graded so many papers. I could almost sniff out cases of plagiarism, you know. I always could. (laughs) You can tell when students plagiarize. You can tell when they're misrepresenting a source. But I never had a student who did anything as bad as what Howard Zinn did. You look at what he did. It's absolutely incredible in terms of distorting history. I want you to talk about how he took the new world and he painted that new world as though it was a feminist paradise. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, that comes from William Z. Foster's book, you know, and that's the Marxist version that the new world was this egalitarian feminist paradise that was spoiled by the evil capitalist coming in and raping the land, subjugating the people, introducing warfare. That is not the case at all. You know, Howard Zinn presents the Native Americans as these holy people, innocent, childlike people who were exploited by the Europeans and, you know, had lived in harmony until the Europeans came. But if you look at, you know, what was going on, there's constant warfare. There was capture of war prisoners, of torturing war prisoners to death in gruesome ways, of cannibalism, of enslaving the women, you know, and children and forcing them into new tribes. You know, there were atrocities committed by the Europeans, too. But what Howard Zinn does is he presents this Manichaean worldview where all Native peoples, all primitive peoples are virtuous, and that all Western people, Europeans, are evil. And so it's this cartoonish view of history where you've got good versus evil. And, of course, anyone who comes from the West or adheres to Western values 
is in the evil category. It's horrific. It's it's almost debilitating. I loved your book. I read it again this weekend. In fact, my watch kept telling me, get up and stretch your legs. And I kept <laughs> reading and reading. But chapter four in particular caught my attention. America, the racist. I think this is one of the most important chapters considering our contemporary situation. Uh. Talk about this skewed view of racism, this idea that America is the most racist nation in all of history, that we've basically invented racism. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's the topic of the book I'm working on right now, which is debunking the 1619 Project. Yeah, Howard Zinn promotes that view. And again, that is the Communist Project. When the Communist Party USA was set up in the United States in New York City in 1919, That was one of their first objectives. They saw racism, which there was, and segregation as the weak point in American society. And, of course, there has been racism and prejudice and xenophobia, you know, throughout history, everywhere. And it was in the United States among different groups as well. There's the Irish and the Italians, and, you know, there are always group conflicts. But the communists saw this as an opportunity for exploitation, and that's what Howard Zinn does. Now, the communists presented themselves to many black Americans as offering a way out of their oppression. And, of course, they presented communism as a way to overcome racism and prejudice. And that, of course, was not the case at all. What the communists were doing was exploiting blacks, and often to the point of death. And for the most part, African Americans saw through this. I mean, they didn't fall for it. But Howard Zinn promotes that message. So he presents a few people who were dupes of the communists, and presents them as these path-breaking heroes, black heroes, when in fact they weren't. And so he presents this completely distorted picture. And when he talks about the Civil War, he claims that, you know, Abraham Lincoln was not the great emancipator. He you know, didn't care about blacks, that he didn't care about slavery. And he presents this view of America as basically that blacks are still enslaved, that nothing really, nothing has freed blacks, that the civil rights movement did no good, emancipation did no good, that there is cause, you know, so he's writing, you know, in post-60s, there is cause for rioting. And he's always presenting the idea of socialism as the cure for, you know, racial discrepancies. And so he presents this very hopeless situation, and his message is, you cannot get ahead in the American system because it is so racist and so corrupt that it will keep beating you down, which of course is absolutely the wrong message you want to give to young people, especially if they're struggling. You know, I mean, the message is don't even try. The system is going to beat you down. Instead of trying, working hard, studying, the message is go out into the street and revolt. I want you to expand a little bit on this 1619 project. This is a complete juxtaposition of dates. 1776 now is going to evaporate, and 1619 is going to become the date that's prevalent in everybody's mind. It's going to be predominant. That's the idea, right? Mm -hmm. It's a reframing of American history of the founding, yes. And you're writing a book on debunking this project. Yeah. So the 1619 Project was a special issue of the New York Times Magazine that came out in August of 2019. 
And the creator of that is a New York Times writer named Nicole Hannah-Jones. And she presumably thought up this thing and she wrote the lead essay. And so the issue contains her essay, which has a number of gross distortions of history, just like Howard Zinn does. It also contains other articles and poems and photographs. And the argument behind it is that the first arrival of slaves here who stayed is really the founding of the country and that the words in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution really had no meaning until, you know, black Americans led the way and showed white America how to really implement those ideals and make them real, which is a term that she uses. That also is a Marxist view. She has expressed her admiration for Fidel Castro. A lot of what she writes and tweets is Marxist in orientation. And that's another text that has been implemented in, last I heard, 45,000 different schools across the United States. So kids are learning it, have been learning it for over a year. And there's going to be a set of books, some of them for children, which are coming out early this year. Oprah Winfrey is producing some movies related to the 1619 Project. And so what the ultimate goal is to eliminate the 4th of July. I can predict that we're going to be seeing calls to no longer celebrate the 4th of July. And she got a Pulitzer Prize, I think, didn't she? Yeah, yeah, she got a Pulitzer Prize. Exactly. It's outrageous. It really is. It totally is outrageous. And I think what's happening overall is that This idea of slavery, as reprehensible as it is, is being posited as something that is advocated by Christians when in fact, and you point this out, I believe in the book, there's a Muslim role in slavery. There's a Mm -hmm. Muslim role in slave trade, and it's largely being ignored by Western elites. In fact, Islam is being promoted as being a better way to go if you're going to be religious than Christianity. Yeah, it's ludicrous. <laughs> you know, the adoption of Islam by many African Americans, you know, that started back in the, I think it really got going in the 1960s, and before that there was Marcus Garvey. But that's a whole story. And this notion that Well, for Howard Zinn, the notion is that, you know, communists were really the only ones who were fighting against racism. The 1619 Project gives absolutely no credit to any whites, none of the Quakers and the other denominations that worked to end slavery, often at risk to their own lives and to their own sort of well-being. And, you know, I mean, the thing about slavery is that it was a worldwide phenomenon from the beginning of time. And when we're talking about slavery in the United States, it wouldn't have been possible to have slaves here unless you had the traders, many of them Muslims on the west coast of Africa, selling the slaves. I mean, this notion of the slave traders going into the interior of Africa and hunting down and capturing people and then enslaving them is a historical myth. What happened was that these were captives in warfare by other tribes who were then sold to slave traders on the coast, and the slave traders came and bought them. And the people selling the slaves were Muslims or they were animists or whatever religious beliefs they had. You know, in Africa, 
those who were selling them in Africa, you know, were not Christians. I mean, there were, you know, people who owned slaves who, you know, were Christians, but it was a largely Christian movement that emancipated the slaves. You know, it was a combination of Enlightenment ideas and Christian ideas that for really the first time in history looked at enslavement and said that this is wrong. I mean, outside of that, it was just sort of like, you know, who's going to question it? People were used to doing it for so long that there was no need to question it. And I quote a sultan of Morocco who was asked about it by a Brit in 1842 and, you know, asked, what are you going to do about slavery and uh, the sultan says well, what are you talking about <laughs> you know what's wrong with it right so the credit is not given where it should be given and we mentioned briefly lincoln and the fact that lincoln's statues are being attacked mm. in america and that president lincoln is now being portrayed as a cowardly racist politician that was beholden to powerful money interests. People forget that he was assassinated for mm -hmm. his anti-slavery position. Exactly. So this is a complete reversal of history and not just tangential or unimportant. This is right at the epicenter of why we fought a civil war. Yeah, I mean, it became complicated. It became a war to end slavery, and Lincoln never liked slavery. He thought it was wrong, but he also had the task of keeping the Union together and, you know, had to make political decisions. He couldn't do what Howard Zinn presents him as being able to do, which is, with the snap of a finger, just outlaw slavery. I mean, that's Zinn's sort of fantasy portrayal of what a president can do. And, you know, Lincoln, yeah, he died for the cause. He was killed. And it really is astounding that young people who have been educated in this way, they've lost their sense of human decency. I mean, they are so quick to condemn people of the past, who do not adhere to their standards exactly, and to demolish their reputations. And they really, they don't know what they are doing, but they have been so steeped in this toxic history that they don't know any better. I think they're at the point where they're not willing to listen to any other perspective. And it's really quite dangerous. I mean, they want to wipe out history. And what they want to institute is this communistic regime. And they don't even know what they're talking about. You know, they're acting in complete ignorance and anger. Yeah. You know, as I was reading through your book again this weekend, I was thinking over and over again that this is not just about debunking Howard Zinn anymore. You're communicating something that is so important because it is an antidote against a pervasive cultural narrative. It's now a mm -hmm. cultural narrative in which we're indicting America and we're promoting communism in which kids today, and I've heard this with my own ears, I have 12 kids. When you have a lot of kids, you hear from a lot of kids. <laughs> but kids today are now saying things like Hitler's Germany was no worse than the United States of America. Mm -hmm. That even Imperial Japan was a victim of American aggression. This is part of the conversation that kids are now involved in because of what they themselves have learned from educators, from quote-unquote historians. Yeah, and that's what Howard Zinn says. Well, what Howard Zinn does, one of his rhetorical strategies, is to ask these leading questions. And that's in order to make the young or naive reader think that, you know, they're coming upon the answer themselves. But he asks, you know, were we any better than the fascists? 
and he insinuates that you know fascism was baked into our bones and you know that we were imperialistic and we murdered and we put the Japanese in internment camps you know just like the Nazis and of course that's why you've got these these kids believing that you know we had no business criticizing the Nazi regime or Japan because we were just as bad if not worse <laughs> Yeah, and I want to go back to something that you said about Howard Zinn and the Communist Party USA, or CPUSA, and how successful they are in placing individuals in selected government agencies. I mean, this really is terrifying. And it's also revealing in terms of what's happening in our culture today. Yeah, well, the State Department and other agencies were full in the 1930s and 1940s, you know, I'd go through how FDR let them in, and they were spying, and Alger Hiss, and Whitaker Chambers, and that whole thing, which Howard Zinn denies. He calls it a red scare, selling our military secrets. So they use them to shoot down our planes, just, you know, rife with these individuals. I think what we're seeing today is the adoption of the ideas of the CPUSA without people even really being aware of where their ideas originate. The idea that if you are for free enterprise and for constitutionalism, that you are automatically a white supremacist, that you cannot be someone who is for racial equality unless you hold socialist ideas. That's where they've become successful in terms of sort of changing the conversation. So, you know, they've succeeded in making people equate socialistic ideas with openness and being non-racist. I was listening to an interview with Nicole Hannah-Jones, the creator of the 1619 Project, and, you know, her version of true democracy, true American ideals is to have universal health care. And she said blacks were leading the way on that. And that's a civil rights issue, you know. <laughs> and so if you were to say, well, you know, I believe there should be equal opportunity for people regardless of race, but I don't think that universal health care or government-sponsored health care is good, well, they'll charge back and say, oh, you're a racist. You'll say no. And they'll say, yeah, yes, you are, because they have succeeded in confusing the issues. And Howard Zinn did that. So he equates socialism with anti-racism. And so that's why people have such a strong emotional attachment to socialistic ideas, because they don't want to be racist. And I think that's a tribute to our country. You know, we're not a racist country. That's why People go to such extremes to, you know, not be tainted with that. And as they do that, as they, you know, seek to not be tainted by that charge, they often adopt these erroneous, confusing ideas. And, you know, with the Democrats in charge, I think we're going to be seeing this more and more. I mean, they always do that, but what they want to do is to slip in their socialistic ideas under the cover of race. Yeah, there's no question about that. And I think they're certainly succeeding in doing that by supporting Black Lives Matter as an organization, an organization that is founded by trained Marxists and an organization that now has made huge inroads into corporate America. Yeah, 
that's a very good example. Right. I mean, you know, they put you in a spot. You know, how can you not believe Black Lives Matter? <laughs> you know, and then if you say, well, you know, I don't believe in their Marxist principles, well, it's still, you know, you're cornered and forced to either accept that saying or, you know, be charged with racism. And like I said, to the credit of Americans, you know, we don't want to be racist. I mean, that is a charge that really stings. And if we were racist, the charge would not sting. I think when you think about this organization, how bold and brazen they are. I mean, I remember when I first started researching this organization, I went to their website. And on their website, it says for everyone to see that they are involved in disrupting the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. Mm -hmm. They want to free people from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking. They want to decouple gender and sex. And they're not trying to hide this. They're saying this, and corporate America seems to be proud of it and pouring all kinds of money into the organization. This is an organization whose co-founders talk about being trained Marxists. It's absolutely stunning. Yeah, well, you know, whenever I see a picture of the guy that runs Twitter or Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, or these CEOs, you know, who are in their 40s and 30s now, well, these are the people who've been educated by the Zen version of American history. These people are now in charge. And, you know, I saw the potential when I was, you know, in graduate school in the 90s and teaching during graduate school and then afterwards and seeing, you know, the beginning of this. And the people now in charge have adopted the Zen version of American history, they've adopted the cultural Marxism, they're in charge. The scary thing is they see nothing wrong with those principles that you just repeated. To them, that's fine. Or else they really are the power-hungry, greedy oligarchs. You know, I'd look at Jeff Bezos I mean, that's all he is. I mean, you know, you talk about capitalist greed. Uh, <laughs> you've got someone right there, you know, owns Amazon and the Washington Post. I mean, what they're doing is really, really evil. They're corporate dictators, but they are convinced of the rightness of their views. They are not open to any debate or any evidence to the contrary. They don't want a conversation. They don't value the idea of the First Amendment or rational discourse or the rule of law. They are power-hungry people. And I could go into, you know, my other theories about, you know, how our educational system has made them this way. But they are egomaniacs and impervious to any kind of human empathy or open-mindedness. This weekend, when I was reading your book, Chapter 8, titled Ho, 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 Chi Min, Howard Zinn, and the Cummies Win. I couldn't help but thinking about my own trip to Vietnam just a few years ago and making the correlation between children watching videos produced by the Zinn Educational Project and the videos I watched in Ho Chi Minh City. Oh. <laughs> the indoctrination video, what really happened to the Vietnam War. Oh, my goodness. It's <laughs> absolutely incredible because Ho captivated many Americans with his charisma, with lying, with evading, being evasive with respect to truth propositions, with flattery, making empty promises, and people bought into it. And I see that same thing happening in our political system today. It's terrifying. 
Yeah, I've never been to Vietnam, but I had a friend who went there, and he said that if you're sitting at an outdoor cafe, they have these loudspeakers where the government gives messages. I don't know, but yeah, what you see at the Zen Education Project, a lot of what you see on PBS is propaganda. You know, and it's government funded. I mean, PBS is government funded. The Zen Education Project is nonprofit. It's funded by anti American foundations. And their objective is to bring down this country or fundamentally transform it, as, you know, Obama said back right before he was elected the first time that he would do. Maybe a good way to end this very, very important podcast. At the end of your book, you talk about professors today who say, we trust our K-12 through kids to know how and when to present challenges to receive knowledge. So let's not worry about all of this because kids can figure it out. What's the response to that? No, kids cannot figure it out. It's really criminal what the Howard Zinn version of education does. It emotionally manipulates kids. The Zinn Education Project doesn't rely on, you know, reading and contemplation and lectures and discussion. It's role play, and these are all preset with a determined outcome. They play on children's emotions, They pit them against each other. They pressure them into agreement. If they don't, they are socially ostracized. It's a form of brainwashing. And that's the reason, you know, Howard Zinn went into teaching. It's the reason why there's a young people's history of the United States. It's the reason why... A history of the United States is used in high schools. It's to get Americans before they're mature. And it also tells them, uh, Howard Zinn does this in a people's history. He comes right out and he says, don't believe other versions of history. These people are the other historians, the very well-respected historians, are upholders of the imperialistic, cruel regime that is America, I am exposing them. That's what Howard Zinn says. Of course, it's a big lie. So especially young people are lured by this kind of rhetoric, and they feel that they are being given the true version. Everything else is a lie And so they are discouraged from even entertaining any other version of history. They've gotten it from Howard Zinn. It's the only book they need. Everyone else's is a lie. And that's a real, real danger when you no longer are even willing to listen to another point of view That's what happens in cults. That's what happens in brainwashing. Yeah, I don't think that's too strong a word to use, because if you suppress all of the information on one side of a ledger, and then you evoke the other information, even if it's false information, that is, by definition, a brainwashing. And I wonder how, when you have presented the other side of the case, taken Columbus and presented what he really said, as opposed to what Zinn says he said. How have you managed to survive? I mean, it seems like there would be an outrage against you that would basically eliminate you from the public discussion. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, I have been attacked, you know, especially when I did the White House conference by a bunch of historians, history professors who now have cushy jobs. I mean, I was basically canceled before cancel culture was known for expressing my views. I was denied opportunities to teach. I was teaching on an adjunct basis. If you look at the Amazon page for my book, there are almost 500 comments. A lot of 
people have given it five stars, but many people give it one star. You can tell that they haven't read it. They won't even turn to it. Yeah, I mean, that's what the left does. They do not want to engage. They want to cancel you. They want to make you an unperson. So, you know, it's your views. If you write for Epoch Times, like I have, or for any of the other conservative publications, or your book is published by Regnery, oh, well, you are just not a person to even be acknowledged, you know, regardless. It doesn't matter what your scholarship is based on or the degree you have. And so, you know, I saw it when I had lost a couple teaching positions where you are basically kicked out, you are disregarded, and, you know, your livelihood is denied to you. And this is the corruption of education. And, you know, I hope, though, that people pick up my book and read it. And I'll relate it to my experience in teaching college. You know, when I was teaching at Emory, I was teaching under a privately funded program called the Program in American Democracy and Citizenship. And I was teaching freshman composition, but I was using many of the foundational texts of American history, such as speeches, the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, sort of trying to impart, you know, what the American system is. And, you know, by college, a lot of students are already indoctrinated and they kind of turn a skeptical eye. And, you know, and you talk about the evils of communism and they're thinking, oh, wow, this lady, you know, it's the Red Scare all over again. But occasionally you do get across to students, and they've come to me and said, wow, I didn't know this about so-and-so, and, you know, what you said was different from what I'd been taught in high school. So I'm hoping that at least, you know, with my book being out there, people will pick it up and will at least make them think and reconsider even if they pick it up in skepticism. And, of course, there are very many good people like you who are willingly reading it and wanting to find out exactly how Howard Zinn wrote this distorted history, what strategies he used. And, you know, I'm grateful for that and for being able to spread the word. Well, first of all, we're a research organization, Christian Research Institute, and I can vouch for your research capabilities, for your scholarship, for your writing prowess, for your communication skills, and I would also say for your bravery. I was going to ask you a final question, what can we do? But I think I'll answer that question by saying that what people ought to do is get a copy of this book, and we'll make it available for anyone that supports our organization. So I'm now speaking to everybody listening in. You can get a copy of Debunking Howard Zinn, exposing the fake history that turned a generation against America, an incredibly important subtitle. Again, exposing the fake history that turned a generation against America. This book available for anyone that supports the ministry of the Christian Research Institute. You can check it out on the web. It is prominently displayed there on the web at equip.org. You can also write me at Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. I am deeply grateful for your bravery, for your scholarship, all the things I mentioned, your writing prowess. You're an excellent writer. I loved reading the book. I think this book can really make a difference if it gets out broadly. And so I'm appealing to my audience all around the world to get this book and not only read it, but tell other people about it. You don't have to even read the whole book. I mean, if you read just the first few chapters or you read that great chapter titled America the Racist, it will open your eyes to what's happening in our culture. This is not just about Howard Zinn. This has gone way beyond Howard Zinn now. 
This has taken root, as Dr. Graber has so eloquently expressed it, taken root in our culture, and it has transformed and even poisoned the minds of multiplied millions of people, not just students in America, but students all around the world. So this is an incredibly important resource, and we have to support people that do what Dr. Mary Graber has done. She has stood up for truth. And truth is, as I've said many times, so obscure in these times and falsehood so established that unless you love the truth, you cannot know it. And unless we stand for truth, this great experiment in liberal democracy is going to end. Empires end. Empires rise and fall. And so we have to stand for truth. If the Christian church is simply going to embrace moralistic, therapeutic deism, the Christian church is not going to be what it needs to be in the culture, a leavening force. And Jesus said it plainly. I've mentioned it many times in the podcast. If the salt loses its saltiness, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Dr. Mary Graber has been salt and leaven in this culture by being willing to speak truth to power, to do it eloquently, to do it bravely, to do it compellingly. And she ought to be thanked rather than rebuked. Again, read her book. It's transformative for our culture. And with that, I want to thank you. Dr. Graber, for your contribution to our culture. I think it's so timely, so important. And it puts the finger on exactly where the problems are in our culture today. Well, thank you so much. That message is just something I needed to hear today, and I'm so glad to be recognized, you know, especially in the face of the hostility out there. And I really appreciate your having me on and being able to discuss this and, you know, pointing to the fact that it really is the truth that matters. And we're going to try to get as much recognition for your communication as possible. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing what you have done. I've written some controversial books in my time within the context of Christianity. I wrote my first book, Christianity in Crisis, Against the Health and Wealth, the Prosperity Gospel. And it wasn't an easy thing to do. And so I know what you're going through. I've gone through it myself over the course of a very long career at the Christian Research Institute. So again, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and we'll do everything we can to get your message out. Okay, well, great. Thank you so much. God bless you. Again, the book available through the Ministry of the Christian Research Institute. Check it out on the web at equip.org, or write me at Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code, 28271. We're committed to bringing the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people on the planet to you. And I think we've done that once again today with Dr. Mary Graber and this important resource, Debunking Howard Zinn, exposing the fake history that turned a generation against America. Get your copy on the web at equip.org. So long for now.